The study this morning is simply entitled, The Attitude of Gratitude. Verse 11, chapter 17. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. I suppose that many of us have glanced at this scripture before. And yet the thing that's so powerful about God's word is that it's always inspiring and always challenging. Amen? As we look right here, we find that Jesus, as usual, is teaching and preaching to people on his way. And as he's going into one particular village, the Bible says that ten men who had leprosy stood out a distance and all of them start crying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They'd heard about the Lord. They'd heard about his miracles. And they saw him as their only hope. Jesus simply sees them and says, go and show yourself to the priests. And the Bible says that as they went, they were cleansed. And you've got to just sort of have a sense of the feeling that these men must have felt in being cured of leprosy. I don't know whether you've ever seen anybody that has the scars of leprosy, but it's one of the most gross disfigurements of the human body that there possibly can be. I'll never forget a few years ago, being in Bombay, and when you're over there, whenever you stop at a stop sign in a taxi, just a lot of people start sticking their hands in the window and a lot of the beggars come on up. But I'll never forget one particular instant when an older man came on up and he stuck his hand in. I just looked at his face and where his nose was supposed to be is just a giant hole and the rest of his face was just disfigured. This man had leprosy. And you know, when you think about these men right here crying out to Jesus, these men had the same disease and were crying out with the same sense of panic that even those in the modern world have when they're struck with this disease. And the most amazing thing happened. Jesus simply says, go, show yourself the priest. And the Bible says that as they went, they were cleansed. And then look what happens. Verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. Now, there's a man who appreciates what God has done for his life. Amen? And, of course, the whole analogy right here that is so clearly seen is the fact that all of us, in a very real way, are spiritual lepers with sin. The Lord says, go on your way, be forgiven, be cleansed. And, of course, the question comes, how many of us come back to God and remember that it is He who's healed us? Not only do we remember, but how do we come back to God? This man came back to God, praising him in a loud voice. There was no way you could contain his joy. It was natural. The Bible says that when he finally found Jesus again, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And the Bible simply adds this footnote, he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said, rise, go. Your faith has made you will. You know, the most amazing thing right here, evidently the other fellows that were cleansed were Jewish. Of the same race that Jesus was. And the Samaritans, of course, were sort of, dare we say, the half-breeds at that time. And the Jews and Samaritans hated one another. And the Bible says that the only one of the ten that came back was the Samaritan. Because, you see, he appreciated being cleansed in an extra special way because... He realized the Jews didn't even talk to the Samaritans, let alone having his whole body cleansed of leprosy. But the other man, they just simply went on their way, and though they were, I'm sure, appreciative of being cleansed, they forgot to thank God. You know, I wonder as we entered this past holiday season, a time when we came together with our families and friends and loved ones and 
I don't know about you, but we had a great time on Thanksgiving Day. We had the Lightnings over and the Knudsons and Steve Richards, of course, Karen de Blasio and always Mo Adame. Naturally, I was in front of him in line. Always, always be aware of that. And we had a great time. We had a devotional to, to begin with, and there was nothing like having that sort of family devotional together to set our minds on what we truly need to be thankful for. And you know, if there's anything that sometimes I I think that we forget, we're like these other nine who go on away, and yeah, we're sort of happy that we got our sins forgiven. Yeah, we're sort of happy about the great things that are happening in our Christian life, but we forget to go back to God in a loud voice, praising Him, and just simply falling on our knees and say, Praise God, thank you for all you've done for me. That's what Thanksgiving should be all about, amen? Well, you know... It's not simply a matter of this is the good thing to do. But James 4, in verse 17, teaches this. If you know the good that you ought to do, and you do not do it, it is sin. If you know the good that you ought to do, and you do not do it, it is sin. You know, so often when we think about sin, we think of lust, or adultery, or murder, or theft, or lying. But the Bible teaches not only in the sins of commission, but the Bible teaches in the sins of omission. And one of the greatest sins of omission is the sin of ingratitude. And, you know, we wonder, well, why don't I feel that close to God? Why isn't God blessing my life? Maybe you simply have the sin of ingratitude in your life that's blocking your relationship with God. And so the challenge this morning is a very simple one to have the attitude of gratitude. I want us to look at some of the writings of the inspired Apostle Paul and to see the thankfulness about the many things about Christianity that welled up in Paul's heart and to see if we can't cultivate that same attitude of gratitude in our hearts this morning. Let's begin in the book of Romans. Chapter 1, verse 8. Just get a sense of the thankfulness of Paul right here. He says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of the Son, is my witness how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. Notice to whom Paul is thankful. Paul is thankful to God. For what? Well, the church at Rome and the fact that their faith is being reported about all over the world. You know, sometimes I think that we really don't appreciate the church right here in Boston. Oh, sure, you know, it's nice. You know, I mean, we've got some nice elders, and the elders' wives, well, they're pretty nice, you know. And, oh, yeah, you know, the ministers, they're, they're pretty good guys, you know, most of the time. And, sure, we've got a nice Bible talk to go to during the week, and, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a long trek into the Boston Garden, but it's good to see everybody. But, you know, that wasn't Paul's attitude about the church at Rome. He said, listen, I thank my God for your faith that's being reported about all over the world. And sometimes I think we really take for granted the opportunity that we have just being in this congregation. You know, some of you that have recently come to Christ in the last few months, perhaps we can sort of, uh, dare we say, excuse you for not appreciating all the things that are happening. But bottom line, so many of us owe our salvation to the Lord working through this congregation through the preaching of the Word. Amen to that? But even more than that, there are people all over the world that are hearing about this congregation because of brothers and sisters that have been trained here that have planted new churches in other places. About three years ago, we planted a church in downtown Chicago. And the most exciting thing, I just talked to Roger Lamb last night. They have already seen 162 people come to Christ this year. Isn't that exciting? Uh, It's exciting to think about the work in London. We knew about the Hope Campaign for Christ this summer, and already over 240 have come to that great city. Isn't that exciting? Praise God. Then in New York, a work that's only a little bit over two years old, they have had already over 2 
hundred people baptized in the Christ this year. Exciting, amen? Of course, the work in Providence just began a few months ago, and already 17 people have come to Christ down there, and we're super excited to be able to see that work growing. Perhaps the thing that's most exciting to me this morning is about the work in Toronto. Things sort of started a little bit slow. They started to work about the 1st of September. And by October 25th, they'd seen seven people come to Christ. We praise God for each one of those people coming to Christ. But in the last month, 19 people have come to Christ through his church planting. Isn't that exciting? And we praise God for the way that he's working through men like Henry Crete and his wife Marilyn and Mark Mancini and his wife Connie and, of course, Barbara Noka and everybody else that's there. We just simply praise God. And wherever I travel, people are always asking about this congregation. People are always asking, well, what really makes it go? Well, what's the difference? Why are you able to have such an impact in the city there and be able to send these brothers and sisters all over the world? And I really believe that one of the key elements is your faith in God. And for that, I'm very thankful. And yet, brothers and sisters, let's not take for granted what we have in this place. Amen? Let's move on with Paul. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians. There's so much to be thankful for. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 14, it's one of my favorite scriptures. Paul right here just sort of bursts out. He says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in a triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? You know, right here, the Bible says that God is always leading us in a triumphal procession. Now that's exciting, amen? When you look around in the world today, you see defeat, discouragement, People who are downcast. Let me tell you something. It's great to walk with Christ in victory. It's great to walk with Christ in victory. Well, how do we do that? He says, well, he says, you've got to understand what you are to God. You've got to understand what you are to the world. And he says this. He says, you are the aroma of Christ. That's what you are to God. And that's what you are to the world. Of course, to those people in the world who reject the message, you are what the Bible says right here, the stench of death. The stench of death. And if you've ever been around death, whether it be a dead animal or even human death, I mean, there isn't a worse smell. And the people who do not love God, who do not want a relationship with them, they're not going to want a relationship with you. And so often, you know, that makes us feel like we're failures or we're rejected. No, 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 no. We are to be the aroma of Christ. Amen? But see, here's the great thing. To those who want salvation, to those who are saved, we are the very aroma of Christ, the fragrance of life. And you know, one of the great senses that we have is smell. And you know how much better it is after you get the deodorant on and the Charlie perfume and all these things, you know. It is a little bit better. Amen? And, you know, when we put on Christ in baptism, we smell a little bit better, right? And we are to be the aroma of Christ to the world. And our victory is not dependent upon who responds, but the fact that we remain the aroma of Christ to everyone. But, you know, there is a great sense of being used by God, isn't there? I mean, one of the most exciting things this past weekend when I was in Mexico City was that uh, we decided to go out into this large park around the royal palace and to share our faith. Well, I don't know how many of you know, but my Spanish is just a little below zero. And uh, so I decided to go with Carmen, who's Elena's sister, and then uh, Martin Bentley went with Brother Treat, and uh, Phil and Donna Lamb went off. We sort of paired up two by two. We thought that might be a good way to go. And uh, we just went out in the park and shared our faith. So we spent an hour or so out there, and it was so neat because Carmen and I sort of shared our faith. I was just saying... You know, CCC, no, 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 you know. Those are the six words I know in Spanish, by the way. Uh, and uh, we're going out there, and, and it was so neat. We just talked to people sitting on the, the, the sides there on the benches, and it was so great. We talked to this one woman named Veronica. That was Saturday. She came to church on Sunday, heard the message on Sunday, 
responded to the invitation and wanted to be baptized. Isn't that exciting? And then wanted to bring her best friend who she was sitting with that day that we also shared our faith with. Let me tell you something. Mexico City is an open place for the gospel. And it's exciting. I mean, there we were, you know, just sort of coming on in. We didn't know anybody, but we wanted to share the good news of Jesus. And you know the kind of feeling that gives you when God's using you? It's really awesome. Amen? For God always leads us in a triumphal procession. But you know, we don't need to just be thinking about Mexico City and all these other places. I mean, right here back in Boston, people need the Lord. Amen? And we're to be the aroma of Christ. One of the most moving things happened. About a week ago, I have a good friend in my neighborhood, Ron Marsh, who became a Christian a little bit over a year ago. And Ron and I have been reaching out to a neighbor across the street from him named Jerry. And uh, we got together. We wanted to give Jerry something special for Thanksgiving. He's really been a great friend to us both. And Jerry's son, his teenage son, has been coming to our uh, teen activities, and he's really enjoyed it a lot. And uh, we, we went on over, we brought him this really nice Bible. Got his name on it, you know, and everything. And we took it on over on Wednesday night. And it was so neat. Uh, we, it was, uh, you know, sometimes us Christians stay up a little bit later than other people in the neighborhood right there. But anyway, Jerry came to the door, you know, his robe and everything. But he was pretty happy to see us, I think. <laughs> anyway, he opened the door. And uh, so he came on in. He said, hey, come on in, you know. And we talked. I said, well, we just wanted to give you this little gift, Jerry. And he opened it up, and there was this Bible. I mean, tears just welled up in his eyes. And he says, listen, I, I can't thank you guys enough. He says, uh, you've done so much for my son. He's so much more serious about his studies. I can see he has a real interest in God. And he says, I, I just want to tell you just how much you guys mean to me. And then I got a little note when after I came back from my trip. And Ron had gotten one, too. It just simply said, dear Kip, is with great humility I accept the most important gift I've ever received, and I thank you profusely for it. I look forward to many joyous hours of use of yours and Ron's gift, and cannot express in proper words the warmth and friendship I feel from both of you. Kip, I am glad I am seeking the Lord, and I'm glad I have you as a trusted friend to pursue this with. I move slowly, but surely, and as time goes on, I'm sure we'll go closer and closer. Thank you so very much for this most incredible gift. And God bless you and Elena and your children, your friend Jerry. Now let me tell you something. That makes you feel awesome. Amen? You see, Christ always leads us in triumphal procession when we remain the aroma of Christ and don't shrink back being afraid of what people are going to think about us. God leads us in victory and it's great to know that God wants to use us. Amen? Well, let's move on and see the other things that Paul was thankful. Let's go on to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 3. Just listen to this. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Talk about an awesome passage. He says, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Well, look in verse 15. He says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Man. Look at what Paul is so thankful about. First of all, he says, listen, I'm thankful for your love for all the saints. You know, I think one of the great challenges of being a growing church is not being self-centered in being a growing church. We need to love our brothers and sisters in other churches even more than we love this church. Amen? And we've already been challenged not to become too familiar and take this congregation for granted. The Bible says right here, and Paul was commending the church at Ephesus, he says, listen, he says, I've heard about your faith in the Lord and your love for all the saints. And the saints in the Bible are just simply talking about Christians. That's how it's used in this particular passage. And, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, do we really appreciate the other congregations in the Lord? How about, are we praying for them every day? I mean, I don't know what churches are closest to your heart, but do you pray for the church in Atlanta? Do you pray for the church in Berkeley? Do you pray for the churches that you go home to when you go vacation in your home sections? 
Let me tell you something. We need to love the brotherhood. Amen? And you may say, well, that church isn't that big or they're not growing as fast. Listen, they're still our brothers. And we need to appreciate them. And it's not just something that we just say, oh, that's a good thing to do. Listen, we really need to do it. See, one of the greatest testimonies, I really believe, to true New Testament Christianity is when people can come into a congregation like this and see young and old, black and white, those that have a very high-paying job and those perhaps with not so high-paying a job, sitting together and you can't tell the difference. But you know, one congregation is not going to be able to win the world for Jesus Christ. We need all the congregations of the Lord to genuinely be together and let it be a world testimony that God loves us because we love one another. Amen? And this is something we've really got to work on. And I really want to encourage us in future seminars. We've got seminars happening in Chicago and in South Carolina and even uh, other groups here in the Boston area. We need to try to get out and really encourage the brothers and sisters by our presence Not just our prayers, so they need our prayers, but by our presence at these seminars. And you know something? I've always found that when I go, I'm super blessed. So I really want to challenge you. Hey, have you made plans uh, to go to the South Carolina seminar in January? Have you made plans to go to the Midwest seminar in February? Or made plans to go to Rocky Mountain seminar? Have you made plans to be with brothers and sisters in other places to encourage the saints and to give a testimony to the world that we love one another? But you know, there's another thing right here in this passage that stands out. Verse 17, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. You know, we need to be thankful that we just know God. You know, I don't know about you, but if I know somebody famous, that makes me feel pretty good. You know, supposedly, uh, today at 11 o'clock, Kip O'Neill is supposed to be down the North Station. And, you know, if he'd come on up and say, ah, oh, Kip, old buddy, old friend, old pal. That'd make me feel pretty good. I go, Tip, how's it going? He says, pretty good, Kip. How's it going with you? <laughs> it's pretty awesome to know famous people, isn't it? I mean, come on, admit it. It's, it's pretty nice. Well, listen, God's pretty famous too. Everybody in the world heard about him. <laughs> and isn't it an awesome thought to think not only that we believe in him, but we know him, we have a personal relationship with God. Now, that's awesome. God really cares about us. The Bible even says that he knows even the number of hairs on our head. And that's easier for him on some people's heads than others. (laughs) But the point is, he knows us and he wants to know us. And what's the prayer right here, Paul? So that we may know him better. Man, if you're thankful, aren't you going to keep on going back to God? How about about over Thanksgiving? We've had a lot more time, right? Right. Most of us have, because most of us have been on some sort of vacation schedule, and that's fine. I think we need to relax and build ourselves up emotionally and physically. I think that's a good thing to do. But you know, how about it? With the extra time, have you spent some extra time with the Lord? Have you just grabbed off a couple of more hours of reading your Bible, just a couple more hours of getting down on your knees and, and really just thanking God and praying to Him? I mean, there is nothing more awesome than trying to know God better. If you're thankful to God, that's what you're going to try to do. And so the challenge is clear. We'll read on right here. Verse 18. So much to be thankful for. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. He says, listen, I want you to open your eyes. I want you to open your eyes and just be able to see the glorious riches of our inheritance in Christ. He says, I want you to know and to remember that you have a power source available to you like none other. You have a power source that is exactly the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, this really throws out the window anybody saying, listen, I can't change. You ever made that statement, maybe? I can't overcome this one sin. I can't overcome this one old habit. Let me tell you something. 
if the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to raise Jesus from the dead, it's powerful enough to change anything in our lives. Amen? But you know, beyond that, the Holy Spirit is even powerful enough to change our character. To change our character. You know, it's, it's rather uncomfortable to think that we don't have everything perfect about our character. If you're unsure if you have everything perfect, just ask your wife, and I'm sure she'll be able to straighten you out there. You know, one of the things that uh, was really something this past week, I got some extra time to spend with one of my discipleship partners, Russ Yule. On Wednesday night, we got together at about, oh, I guess about 9.30, 10 o'clock. He came on over. It was before Thanksgiving, and so, you know, it was really just great to see him. He's just a very special brother to me. And uh, I don't know how we got going, but for some reason he made me go upstairs and get my old high school album out. Now, let me tell you something. That can be a mistake. I, don't, I haven't heard Russ laugh for so long in all of my life. Uh, I thought my picture was okay, quite frankly, but I was a little bit thinner in the face in those days and did have a little bit more hair and all these things. But, I mean... It was really something just to sort of look through the old pictures. You know, I go, oh, yeah, there's me right there. And, oh, yeah, that, uh, that was the old girlfriend there. And, oh, yeah, that's my best friend, Fred Kimball. Yeah, he was an awesome guy, you know. And Russ is just laughing his head off still at my picture. But, you know, as we went through it, and then all of a sudden I flipped open the front and the back and started to read the comments that people made about me. That was embarrassing. Uh... Suffice to say, a lot of the comments, uh, back in those days, we all had nicknames. You know, like, uh, my girlfriend's name was Truck. I won't tell you why. Uh, my brother's name was Amos. Uh, my name was Joe. And the reason it was Joe is really a bad reason, because I really liked football. But worse than that, I reminded everybody, not of Joe Namus' playing ability, but of his conceit. And, you know, like in one of the things, it says, uh, this one person wrote me and says, Oh, Kip, it's really been great to know you this year. Really hope you have fun next year in college in Florida. Just don't get too conceited. Love so-and-so. Wonderful. Uh, it's really inspiring to read that 14-year... Uh. And, you know, I, I have to admit, you know, if, if there are struggles that I have, I would say the two greatest struggles I have are genuinely with pride and with lust. But, you know, I can actually say that since I've become a Christian, I became a Christian after high school and college. God has won victories even in those areas. Isn't that great? And it was great to know that Russ knew a different kip. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the power of God. Amen? To change character. And God can change your character. And he can help you overcome the sins that dog your life. Let's go on to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5 is the admonitions on the family. And Paul says this in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. No question. Paul is challenging the Christians at Ephesus to appreciate who? Their family. Amen? He's saying, listen, husbands, love your wives. Well, how? Just as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? He laid down his life for the church. He laid down his life for the church. You know, one of the greatest tests for how good you're doing as a husband is this little phrase right here in verse 27, that husbands are to present their wives as a radiant church. You know, you can tell how good your marriage is going, brothers, if your wife is radiant. Not radiant 
feet red mad. That's wrong radiance. <laughs> but whether she genuinely glows with happiness and joy that she knows the Lord and has you as her husband. That's a challenge, isn't it? Check it out. Is your wife radiant? That's what he says. Verse 33, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and wives must respect their husbands. You know, it's an amazing thing about the scriptures. They always meet needs. You know, I think one of the things that men have struggled with is just being able to, to talk about their emotions, to, to genuinely love and to give of themselves. It seems so hard for us to. And yet the other time, you know, sometimes the wives have a problem with respecting their husbands. You see, they get to see all the cracks, and some of us have real craters in our lives and things, and so consequently it gets hard for them to respect, but biblically speaking, you know, sure, God realizes that your wife is not perfect, and oh yeah, God realizes that your husband's not perfect, but the Bible says for the husbands, nonetheless, to love the wives, and nonetheless for the wives to respect their husbands, and that just sells the matter right there, amen. But you know, a lot of times, the husbands are waiting to love their wives until the wives respect them. That's a mistake. Or the wives, they're, they're, they're really waiting to respect their husbands until their husbands love them. You see, the Bible teaches that no matter what role you have, husbands or wife, you need to be the best husband you can be. The best wife you can be, not conditional upon the performance of the other. You respond to them as a husband or wife, whatever the role is, because of your love for God. That's what makes awesome Christian marriages. See, in the world, we try to have this conditional love. Not so in Christ. We need to love unconditionally as Christ has loved us. Of course, he's saying not only to appreciate your spouse, and certainly of all the people in the world, if you're married, your spouse needs to be your best friend in the Lord. Amen? But he says, listen, also appreciate what? Children, obey your parents. Listen, we need to appreciate our parents. The most amazing thing, the older I get, the more I appreciate my mom and my dad and all that they've done for me. It was a funny thing. Before I became a, a Christian... I guess in some ways, my parents were the most important thing in my life. Probably I was the most important thing in my life, to be real honest. But I wasn't a very good son. I wasn't very expressive in my love. I wasn't... Man, I just did my own thing. After I became a Christian in college, I saw, man, I have really blown it. And I, I started to really try to make some changes. Now, my parents became the number two priority in my life because Christ was now number one. But the most amazing thing is, even though my parents were not the number one priority in my life anymore... They became number two. I loved them a lot more and was a lot better son because of my love for God. Isn't that amazing? And I've really tried. I mean, it was a, my dad and I, you know how it is. You know, with your mom, you know, when you go to bed at night, you're in high school, you give her a little kiss. With your dad, you sort of wave as you're going up. Night, dad. <laughs> there wasn't much affection. But, you know, now in Christ, I mean, it's amazing. When I see my dad, we can give each other a hug now. Or the most amazing thing. My dad, I usually say, you know, listen, mom and dad, love you both. And amazingly, not only did my mom say I love you, but my dad now says I love you. Let me tell you something. That's truly amazing. <laughs> but it's great, and it's natural, and I think it's because I've tried to be the best son I can be. And so we need to appreciate our parents. Now, neither one of my parents are, are in Christ. They're not Christians yet. When I first became a Christian, they didn't even believe in Jesus. Now they believe in Jesus, and they're working on their commitment. But, you know, I super respect them. I super love them and appreciate all they've done for me through the years. Sacrificing for me for college. I mean, the works. And, you know, now that I'm on the other side of the fence as a parent, I'm appreciating them even more. You know, it's like Mark Twain said, you know, he says, you know, when I was 17, I, I felt that my... Dad didn't know anything. But after four years at college, he said, I came back home and I was surprised at how much my dad knew. That's truly so. Not only is the admonition right here to love our parents and appreciate them so that our life may go well and we enjoy a long life, but he talks about the love that we need to have as fathers and mothers for our children. You know, children are truly a blessing from God, aren't they? i tell you something. I... I love being with some close brothers and sisters in Mexico City, but I really miss being with Elena and the kids. I mean, it's amazing how they sort of grow on you. I mean, it, it's great. You know, Olivia, I mean, she's just growing up to be a little girl. Old Sean, you know, what, what a tank. I mean, he's really great. And then old Eric, he's starting to get around now. I mean, it is, it's just one big happy crew right there. And I really love them. I really appreciate them. And I see that they are such a blessing in my life. I mean, you cannot keep a frown very long in my house. <laughs> 
They are truly a great blessing from God. And yet, you know, we take our family so much for granted, don't we? We need to express our love and appreciation to our wives and our husbands, to our moms and our dads, and to our children. They truly are a blessing from God, and let's not take them for granted. Let's go on to the book of Philippians, and we'll close out in this book. This was a special church with Paul. In chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Do you see the thankfulness just pouring out of the heart of Paul? He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Right here, Paul just pours out his heart in thankfulness to the love that he shared there at Philippi because they were partners in the gospel. You know, one of the things that bonds Christians together is that we go through the ordeals of the Christian life together. A lot of people wonder, well, how do you get good friends? How do you make best friends? Well, you must share common experiences, and certainly we all know the Lord. But you know, one of the things that draws me closer to people, and I think perhaps what the Scriptures is teaching right here, is the fact that you've gone through a common suffering. And you know, when you go through a hard time together, don't you just feel closer? I do. And he said, listen, what draws us all together? Our partnership in the gospel. You know, really getting out there and laying our lives on the line. It just makes you feel closer. You know, after Ron and I went over to Jerry and he just, his eyes just sort of welled up in tears. And we'd just gone over and given the Bible. Let me tell you something. I felt close to Jerry. I felt close to God. But I really felt closer to Ron, see? Because we were what? Partners in the gospel. Right? And I think that a lot of times our Bible talks are not close because we're not all out there working. Listen, if every Christian is sharing their faith, you're going to have an awesomely close Bible talk. Amen? And if you don't feel close to brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, maybe it's because you're not what you need to be in living your Christian life daily and sharing your faith and being a part of the gospel. You know, the Bible teaches in Philemon, and we won't bother to turn there, but it's a very challenging passage. Philemon Verse 19, it's only one chapter. But in verse 19, Paul is writing Philemon about freeing this, this slave. And uh, he sort of uses a little bit of fulcrum with him. He says, listen, I would like for you to, to free on, Onesimus for me. He says, uh, I want you to do this as a something that really just comes from your heart. He says, oh yeah, by the way, uh, don't forget that you owe me your very soul. I love Paul subtly. And what Paul was saying was, you see, Paul was, I'm not sure he was responsible for baptizing, but I think he was responsible for discipling Philemon, see. And, you know, a lot of times we, we really take for granted the Lord in our lives, and certainly he is the power and the strength of our lives, amen? But we take for granted the Christians in our lives. Matter of fact, sometimes we just want to shove them out of our lives because we don't want to change. Well, that's not the attitude. That's not the attitude of gratitude. We need to appreciate the people that have discipled us to Christ. The Bible says, not only do we owe our souls to God, but we owe our souls to them. And let me tell you something. If people have not been involved in our lives, we wouldn't be the people that we are in Christ. Secondly, we also need to appreciate those people that we are discipling in Christ. And yeah, maybe it's more giving than taking, but let me tell you something. We need to appreciate those people we're trying to raise up in the Lord. And there's nothing like expressing. I learned this lesson just a... A few years ago, I was out in Chicago doing some preparation work for the church out there. And I used to live out in Chicago uh, for 6th and 7th grade, and then I graduated there in 12th grade, a little bit north of Chicago, in a little town called Libertyville. And uh, I was with Marty Fuquay, and I said, you know, Marty, we got some extra time this afternoon. Do you think uh, we could go back and visit the old high school? You ever get that urge? Go back and visit the old, yeah, well, anyway. He said, oh, sure, Kip. So we, we drove on out. And just by happened that week, I never heard of a high school to have, but they had alumni week that week. So I said, well, I'm sort of an alumni, you know. So we went on in and showed Marty. I said, oh, right up there, that's the football team. He says, was that you on the left right there, the fat little guy? No, no, bro, I'm, I'm the one right in the middle right there. 
And I showed him, you know, all the different pictures and things. And I said, oh, yeah, over here, that was home room. Oh, what a blast that was. And down here, that was the science room. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Got past that. Anyway, and, and then up on the second floor, I want to show you. This was up here on the second floor, Marty, where we used to have World Lit. And uh, I said, you know, we had a teacher, Mr. Thurston. And yet we didn't call him Mr. Thurston. Well, we called him Mr. Thurston to his face. But he was balding a bit, so we called him Fuzzy Thurston. And I said, now, Marty, this is where old Fuzzy was, right down here. At Marty, Fuzzy's still here. And I, I don't know, you know, probably echoed up and down the hall, you know. And uh, I said, he says, well, why don't you go in and say hi? I said, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Let's go down and see the swimming pool or something like that, you know. So we walked around the rest of the building and he says, you know something, I'd like to go say hello to Fuzzy. I mean, Mr. Thurston, you know. And, and so anyway, we went on in. I sort of knocked on the, uh, the door there of the class. And he looked up. And I, I didn't think he'd ring. He says, he says, Kip McKean. I didn't know exactly. It might have been Kip McKean. But anyway, I do remember my name being spoken. And he says, come on in, you know. And so I came on in. I said, hey, this is a Marty Fuqua, a friend of mine. And, oh, this is a class. I want, want you to meet Kip, you know. He says, he says, he says just stop a second. He says, he says, Kip, he says, let me ask you, you know, how did you do in freshman English? I did, I did, I did pretty well. And he says, now listen, this is what you guys need to do right here, you know. And, and so he bragged on that a little bit. And I said, listen, I, I guess, uh, Mr. Thurston, I just wanted to come on by and just say thanks for all you did for me. Because before I went to this class, I wasn't, a good writer. Jerry Jones doesn't think I'm a good writer any, even now, but I was terrible back then. But I remember I was so used to getting A's and stuff in school, and the first two papers I got were C's. Blew my mind. I was upset. But anyway, he took me aside, showed me what I need to do. I mean, it really helped me in, in my freshman English and really all through life. And I just really wanted to come back and genuinely thank him. And I said, Mr. Thurston, I just wanted to thank you for all that you've done. And I mean to tell you, I mean, the tears just started to come. And he says, he says, well, do you think, Kip, we could have dinner tonight? Or maybe you can come on over and see the family. And it was amazing. I mean, he just, his heart just went out. And I, I said, listen, I, I can't. I've got appointments. But I just wanted to come by and say thank you very much for everything. And I mean, it just, it just hit him. And, I, and as I walked out, you know, I had this warm feeling inside that, that, I, that I'd just taken the time to thank him, you know. But more than that, I started thinking, I said, I wonder how many kids have gone through his classes through the years and have gone back just to say, thank you. And I started thinking, even as with Marty right there, I said, you know, I think I understand about where are the other nine. I said, so often, I'm one of the other nine that don't go back and thank the Lord and thank the people that have had such an awesome impact in my life. And I still remember Fuzzy Thurston. Fifteen years later, balding guy, but had a great impact on my life. But how about it? How thankful are we about the Christians that have been involved in our lives? And let me tell you something. It's great to have a sense of feeling, but there is something about just coming out and saying, Brother, thank you for leading me to Christ. Brother, thank you for discipling me these, these past several months, past several years. I mean, my life is not the same because of our relationship. Expressing what we feel does make a difference. It does make a difference. Well, let's close out in the last part of Philippians 3 here. Paul says, middle of verse 4, If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as the zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, listen, I had so much going for me. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a leader of leaders. In regard to law, as a Pharisee, as for zeal, man, I was so zealous for God, I used to persecute the church. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. 
He had moral background. I mean, he had prestige. He had leadership. He had education. But look at what he says. Now, he appreciated all these things to a degree. He says, but whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He says, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, I consider them rubbish. Now, the actual translation right here in the Greek, uh, New International Version is being uh, very kind right here. The actual translation is dung. That's the literal translation that Paul through the Holy Spirit wrote. Now, Paul, I believe, appreciates the good things that he was brought up with in his background. I mean, he talks about those in other places. He says he even calls these things to his profit. And I think the good things that we've accomplished before we became Christians or even after we became Christians, as far as good things in this world or laudits or honors or whatever, I say praise God for. But Paul is making a statement of appreciation and a sense of priority. He's saying, listen, whatever was my profit, I now consider loss. As a matter of fact, compared to knowing Christ, compared to having my salvation, sort of like dumb. Man, that's sobering, isn't it? I want to ask you a question. How much do you appreciate your salvation this morning? Do you know that as a Christian, you can simply make the statement, I am saved? Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's just sort of happy to say that. I am saved. Amen. Praise God. And you know, if you're not in a saved condition, it's very simple. All you have to do is have faith that Jesus is Son of God. Be willing to repent of your sins and put Jesus Christ first in your life. Be willing to confess Him, Lord, before men and to be baptized to be able to have your sins forgiven, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's just that simple. Isn't God good? And he says, listen, I, I appreciate all the great accomplishments that God gave me and all the talents, but he says, listen, compared to knowing Christ, compared to my salvation, they're nothing, man. Do we really appreciate our salvation? He says, I want to know Christ. Now, here's a guy. Now, Paul has been a Christian when he writes this about 25 years. No excuse in the audience right here about saying, well, he must have been a young Christian, really excited about his faith. And all. Hey, he's been a Christian 25 years. He's still excited about his salvation. He says, I still want to know Christ better. I want to know the power of resurrection and the fellowship of sharing his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Let me tell you something. Paul was looking forward to heaven. He says, listen, I don't know how you resurrect from the dead. I'm just sort of looking forward to it. You know, I've never done it before either, but I am looking forward to it. And isn't heaven going to be a wonderful place? Now look at what he says as he closes. Verse 12. Not that I've already attained all this, or I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold for that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What? An attitude. 25 years of being a Christian, and he says, listen, I'm still not arrived. I've got a long ways to go. But let me tell you something. I am pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Listen, I'm forgetting what lies behind, bad and good, and I'm pressing on towards heaven. Isn't that what it's all about? And you know, I, I really feel that's the ultimate challenge of gratitude, is to press on. Let's rejoice in all the things that God's done for us. Let's rejoice in all the things that God has given us. But let's press on towards the goal of being called heavenward. You know, there's so much to do. So much to do. The article in the bulletin this week is really special to me. My brother Randy is going to be moving to Boston. I'm so excited about that. And he's going to be leading the Tokyo Mission team. And that's exciting to me to be able to have Randy and his family come. And what a great city. I mean, Tokyo, 27 million people. We need a great church there. Amen? Uh, I think about the work in Mexico City. What can be done? I mean, it's the only city I've ever been to that compares comparably to the size of Tokyo. I mean, it's just immense. And the people need the Lord. I think about the plans that we got just this next year as far as church plantings. Believe it or not, in Paris, Stockholm, Johannesburg, and that's just this summer. Let alone a year from now, we're going to Bombay and Hong Kong. I mean, it's starting to really get exciting, amen? But not only is it going to be exciting around the world, but it's even going to get more exciting here. As we grow in the Lord here in Boston, 
as we just simply grow closer to the Lord and one another. But you know what we need to do this morning? We need to shake off the holiday numbness. Shake it off. Some of us need to shake off a little bit more than just the numbness. (laughs) And we need to say, listen, it is time to press on. And the great thing about this season is that a lot of people are thinking about Jesus Christ. But they're thinking about Jesus in a manger when they need to be thinking about Jesus as the Savior. And it is time to preach the Word. It is time to mobilize the forces of Christ and preach the Word all over Boston, telling the good news in a loud voice that Jesus has died for their sins and has resurrected So we have the hope of salvation. Let's not like be the other nine. Let's be like the one guy that goes back to God in a loud voice, praising him, saying, thank you, Lord. And so this morning, let's press on, shake off the numbness, and let's be appreciative. Let's have the attitude of gratitude for all that God has done for us. If you need to respond in any way, whether to become a Christian or simply to ask for the prayers of the church because you've fallen in the sin of ingratitude, come forward to one of the men that are standing in the aisles. They'll give you a card and you can respond there and we'll be praying for you. Let us stand and sing our invitation song.